This is the ASCAR 151PHQ, a quadruplet astrograph refractor and the largest member of the PHQ line from ASCAR. It features a 151mm or 6 inch aperture and a 1050mm focal length for a native f7 focal ratio. In this video, I'll be doing an unboxing of this beautiful new telescope and I will share my first impressions. In a subsequent video, I will share the results of a series of optical tests I am conducting right now on this telescope and its focal reducer, so if you don't want to miss it, make sure to subscribe to the channel. All right, let's get started. First, a quick disclaimer. I'm an Agena Astro affiliate and I contacted them to review this telescope, not just because it is new and shiny, but because I was genuinely considering this telescope as a possible upgrade, since I currently own a 5-inch refractor, which I featured in previous videos on this channel. So this telescope was provided to me as a loan for up to 60 days, and for the purpose of this review, by Agena Astro and Ascar, free of charge. But as you would expect, I have full editorial control over the content of this video, so you will get a perfectly honest and transparent review. Regardless, I wanted to thank Agena Astro and Ascar for letting me test this new telescope. Once the review is over, I can decide to either return it to Agena Astro at their expense or purchase it. I will share my decision at the end of the next video. This telescope competes with the likes of the Skywatcher Esprit 150, the Stellarview SVX 152T, or the Astrotech AT 152EDT, just to name a few. It currently retails for $4,400, which puts it on the lower end of the price range for a refractor of that size. The reducer is priced at $350. I will put affiliate links to these products in the description below. If you want to support this channel, feel free to use those links. Let's talk about who this telescope is for. Given its size, I don't recommend it for people who have to set up and tear down their equipment every night. It is best suited for people who have an observatory or a backyard where you can leave your equipment set up for as long as you want, maybe under a Telegizmo 365 cover like I do. In terms of experience level, I would say that this telescope is better suited for fairly experienced observers or astrophotographers who might be interested in the challenge of imaging with a longer focal length. And finally, it goes without saying that this telescope is not a good fit if all you want to do is take wide field images of the night sky. However, it will excel at capturing fine details on small targets, which is what I enjoy doing the most. All right, so I know that unboxing videos are very popular on YouTube these days, so let's do a quick fake unboxing, because in all honesty, I already unboxed this telescope a long time ago, but I wanted you to get an idea of what the package looks like when you receive it. This is the double thickness cardboard box that was shipped to me via UPS. Inside that box, there is plenty of high density foam padding, so the telescope carrying case is very well protected during transport. And this is the carrying case that was inside that cardboard box. It is roughly 40 inches long, 12 inches wide, and 12 inches tall. For non-Americans, this translates to 1 meter long, 30 centimeters wide, and 30 centimeters tall. With the telescope inside of it, it is also fairly heavy, tipping the scale at over 53 pounds, or 24 kilograms. Overall, it looks like a high-quality carrying case. The telescope itself is very well protected inside that carrying case, thanks to high-density laser-cut foam padding that fits the telescope very tightly, almost too tightly. If you want to install an electronic focuser, you will need to cut through some of that foam in order to make room for it. The carrying case also includes a plastic sleeve, which contains some paperwork like the warranty card, a quality control inspection report, a very basic user manual, and a thumb screw to lock the focuser. Out of the box, the telescope comes pre-installed with a threaded 2-inch visual back, as well as a 1.25 inch adapter. Once you've taken the telescope out of the carrying case, you'll notice that various threaded adapters are provided at the bottom underneath labeled foam covers. These adapters are for astrophotography. 
you'll have the choice between many different threaded connections, M86, M68, M54, or M48. For this review, I will use the M48 adapter. Although technically, if you're planning to use a full frame camera, you'll want to use at least the M54 adapter to limit the amount of vignetting. Note that the M48 adapter allows you to thread a two inch filter. The optical tube assembly, including the rings, the dovetail plate, and the three threaded adapters, but without the lens cover, weighs almost 30 pounds, or 13.5 kilograms. With the dew shield and the focuser fully extended, but without any of the adapters, the tube measures a staggering 47.5 inches, or 120 centimeters. So this telescope is rather heavy and long, which means that you need a fairly good mount. While some people have been able to use it for observing, or EAA, on a ZWO AM5 mount, you will need a beefier mount for serious imaging. I have an Ioptron CEM70, and it works well, but it's probably close to the minimum required. To get good results, you'll also need to make sure that your rig is well balanced. And you can forget about imaging when there is the slightest amount of wind. All right. Let's take a closer look at the optical tube assembly now. The external powder coated paint finish looks absolutely stunning and feels very durable. The dew shield is pretty good. I could not detect any flop once it was locked. And talking about the locking mechanism, I feel like Ascar can improve that a bit. It consists of a single soft tipped locking screw. To make sure that the dew shield does not slip, you have to really cinch down on that locking screw. And with such a small knob, it hurts the fingers to tighten it so hard. It can also leave dark markings on the otherwise flawless paint finish. So my suggestion is to tighten it gently and to use a rubber band or some kind of strap instead of relying solely on this little screw to prevent the dew shield from sliding back. Ascar, if you're listening, please design a better locking system. Other than that, the inside of the dew shield is beautifully lined with black felt, which appears very dark compared to matte black paint. This is a very nice touch. The lens cover is made of aluminum and feels very sturdy. The inside rim of the cover is lined with felt and it just slips on top of the dew shield and stays in place. The objective lens is absolutely enormous. The coatings look great. Actually, the first time I took the lens cover off, it took me a few seconds to notice the objective lens. That's how good the coatings are. The optics came perfectly clean from the factory. I assume that Ascar assembled all of their telescopes in a clean factory where dust is very strictly managed. The inside of the tube is painted in matte black paint and contains a large number of baffles that will prevent unwanted light from reaching the eyepiece or the camera sensor. Let's take a look at the focuser now. It is a massive 3.4 inch rack and pinion style two-speed focuser, and it can be extended out a little over four inches or 10 centimeters. The draw tube has fine distance markings every millimeter, which can be useful. It also comes fitted with a quality 360 degree rotator that locks securely in place without incurring any detectable image shift. It features fine rotation markings for every degree. When I first took the telescope out of the box, I noticed that I was able to move the focuser draw tube by hand. However, by simply tightening a small set screw located underneath the focuser, I was able to tweak the amount of tension to my liking so that the focuser was still very smooth and easy to operate, but would not slip under load, which is important if you are not planning to use an electronic focuser. Since this telescope is not mine, I did not install an electronic focuser. But if I eventually decided to purchase it, I would install the ZWEAF, which is very easy to fit to this focuser. The telescope comes equipped with a short Vixen-style dovetail shoe to attach small accessories like an ASI Air, for example. The rings are beautifully machined out of aluminum and are powder-coated black. On the inside, they are lined with felt. And on the outside, they have several flat surfaces and holes with M6 threads to make it easy to attach accessories, such as a guide scope, a USB hub, or a mini computer. 
The telescope also comes with a pre-installed carrying handle. I was originally planning to replace it with a D-style dovetail plate to attach accessories. But now I think that unless you install this telescope in an observatory, you will want to keep this handle. The tube is so heavy that having this handle makes it a lot easier and safer to manage. And finally, as part of the package, you'll also get a really nice 300mm long D-style dovetail plate. And I have a really important pro tip to share with you regarding the dovetail plate. Can you see these two little holes right here on the underside of the dovetail plate? They have M3 threads. My recommendation is to put in two short M3 screws in those holes. The screw heads will act as a stop, preventing the telescope from sliding back if somehow the dovetail were to work itself loose, for example, as a result of a temperature change. If you read the forums, you'll see that this has happened to some people. So this is a very cheap insurance policy against what could be an utter disaster. Oh, and by the way, these little screw heads also make it a lot easier to mount the telescope. You simply drop the dovetail plate into the dovetail saddle, let it slide back until it stops, and then you can take your time to tighten the saddle. In addition to the telescope, Agena Astro was kind enough to let me test the ASCAR 0.7x reducer, specifically designed for their PHQ series. With this telescope, it brings the focal length down to 735mm or f4.9. It has a nominal back focus of 55mm and it provides several different threaded connections, M68, M54 and M48. This reducer is quite large and heavy and overall it feels like a high quality piece of kit. Let's talk about the optical design of this telescope. It is what we call a Petzval design, even though it has very little in common with any of the optical designs created by Hungarian optician Joseph Petzval in the middle of the 19th century. What the term Petzval means nowadays is that the optical system is composed of two separate lens groups. In practical terms, whenever you see the term Petzval associated with a telescope, think of it as having a built-in flattener that does not have a specific backspacing requirement. The objective lens of this telescope is made of four elements, two of which are supposed to be some kind of ED glass. And the optical design is supposed to provide a perfectly flat field of view without the need for an additional flattener, even when using a full-frame camera. Of course, in the next video, we will verify this claim. And we'll try to understand what kind of compromises ASCAR had to make in order to achieve this, because at the end of the day, any optical design is simply the result of a compromise. Here are some of the tests I will be running. First, we'll check the collimation using a Cheshire eyepiece during the daytime. Next, we'll quantify the amount of longitudinal chromatic aberration using my spectrograph in its low resolution configuration and a Python script I created. We'll compare it to my Astrotech AT130 EDT triplet refractor. We'll also do a wavefront analysis using extrafocal images and some special software to estimate the strel ratio as well as the PV and RMS values. We'll use a full frame color camera, both at the native f7 focal ratio and using the ASCAR reducer at f4.9, and we'll do some pixel peeping in the corners. We'll look for lateral chromatic aberration. We'll also use some aberration inspection software to help us decipher the image. With the reducer, I'll attempt to see if changing the backspacing can help achieve better results and what kind of trade-off changing the backspacing might incur. And finally, I'll also do a quick visual test. Before becoming an astrophotographer, I was a pure visual observer for 25 years. And I am curious to see how this telescope will perform visually using my high quality Teleview Nagler eyepieces. A question you might ask is who in their right mind would want to purchase this kind of telescope as opposed to buying a much cheaper and lighter reflecting telescope like a Newtonian, for example? Well, there is no simple answer and I can only talk about my own situation. I don't want to deal with multiple telescopes, each with their own settings, and I don't have the space to store multiple rigs anyway. So a refractor makes sense to me because a single telescope can cover all of my needs, including deep sky astrophotography and spectroscopy. 
I also do not want to deal with collimation. I want a telescope that just works. So again, a refractor is pretty much perfect for that. And I want a large refractor because I most enjoy doing high resolution deep sky astrophotography on small targets, which requires a longer focal length. And finally, there is the lure of the refractor. You just have to look at the moon through a high quality refractor with a quality eyepiece to understand what I mean. I don't think I can describe with words how enjoyable the views can be through a high quality refractor. It is something that you have to experience for yourself. All right, that's all I have for you today. If you enjoy this type of content, please click like and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. I'll be back in a few weeks for part two of this review. So until next time, thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.